Hello everyone, I'm Professor Plink and I respond to various theological and ideological questions and claims from a rationalistic and naturalistic approach in an effort to give and explain the opposite viewpoint and help to balance the conversation. Today we're looking at a video from World Video Bible School where Kyle Butt has come up with six proofs for God's existence. Let's take a look and see what he has. Let's look at six proofs that show God exists. Number one, the universe must have a cause. The most fundamental law of science is the law of cause and effect. And it says that for every material effect we see, there is a cause that came before it or was simultaneous to it, and that is greater than it. Interesting that you're quoting something here, but providing no citation for the quote. So, I'm not sure what it is you're referencing here, but this is certainly not a scientific principle the way that you've laid it out. Now, certainly there is Newton's third law of motion that states for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction, but that says nothing about the supposed greatness of the cause. This notion of the cause being greater than the effect is an archaic notion probably most famously attributed to Descartes' proofs of God's existence. But that makes this a theological argument, not a scientific law. And in practical terms, the very idea of a cause being necessarily greater than the effect is laughably wrong. Under the right circumstances, a simple tiny spark can cause a raging forest fire or catastrophic explosion. On a snowy mountaintop, a slightly too loud noise can cause a massive avalanche. Every day all around us there are effects happening that are several orders of magnitude greater than that which caused them. And that doesn't even get into the idea of what you mean by greater. That's a value judgment and subject to interpretation. Greater in what regard? In chaos theory, a butterfly flaps its wings and weeks later, that action causes a tornado. Was the butterfly's wings greater than the tornado? And if so, why? Because the butterfly is a living creature and the tornado isn't? Why does that make it greater than the cataclysmic event that it caused? If you don't believe in a creator, then you have to suggest something like uh, a singularity. That's what is popular today, that there was some type of singularity that exploded in something called the Big Bang. But then when you try to get down to the bottom of what's a singularity, well, what we hear from the scientific community that suggest to us, the, the cosmologists, they say, well, a singularity was something that popped into existence from nothing. That is not what the scientific community defines the singularity as. Big Bang cosmology has determined that due to the movement of everything in the galaxy and its continued movement away from each other, that all movement in the universe can be traced back to a single point of extreme density and heat. That is what is known as the singularity. Science makes no claim whatsoever about where it came from or the beginnings of its existence. Do you know that if there ever were a time when there was nothing, that's exactly what we would have now? The idea that something popped into existence from nothing is simply not a scientific idea. You're right, it isn't a scientific idea, which is why science never claims anything of the sort. Something coming from nothing is an idea of creationists. Something coming from nothing, or ex nihilo, is how creationists like yourself believe the universe came into being. That God created everything out of nothing. Not that God created the universe from a part of himself, or some already existing matter that he just reformed into the universe, but out of nothing. Creation ex nihilo. And, as you just stated, that is not a scientific idea. That that singularity is somehow natural, but it behaves supernaturally. They say that that singularity wouldn't have followed the laws of nature. Well, then, so what are we left with? We're left with the fact that the universe had a beginning, and it was not a natural cause. It was something above nature. It was something super nature, something supernatural. You haven't established any of that. You claim science says the singularity began out of nothing, which it doesn't. Insisted that science says the singularity acts in supernatural ways, which science certainly doesn't claim. And then conclude that therefore, the supernatural must exist in the form of God. 
That conclusion doesn't even follow from your previously erroneously established points. It could just as easily point to 8th dimensional unicorns belching this universe into existence. Number two, design demands a designer. It is a truism that everybody recognizes that this universe looks designed. No, it isn't. That is not a truism at all. It's not even true that everyone agrees the universe looks complex or ordered, which you're substituting for designed in your argument. There are many areas in this universe that are about as chaotic as we can imagine. The nearer you get to a black hole, the more the very laws of physics break down. Also, at the quantum level, many of the laws of physics become irrelevant. The fact that there is some structure, some order, in some parts of this vast universe no more points to design than a random pile of leaves falling into the shape of a face points to design. Complexity or order can arise out of randomness. We look at the design of the human body and the human hand and the arm and the leg and the brain and we see that those are some of the most advanced, technologically savvy pieces of equipment ever put together. I don't care for how you try to slip in little statements like that. We do not look at brains or organs or limbs and call them technologically savvy. This seems a transparent attempt to put biology on the same level as technology in order to insist that because iPads are designed, then so too must be your brain. Biology is biology, technology is technology. You don't get to muddy the waters by blurring the lines between them. Where does design originate? Well, what you and I both know is that when you see things that function and they're complex, that design comes from an intelligent designer. Really? That is all that's required to confirm design? Functionality? Something does something, therefore there must have been an intelligence behind it? This establishes one of the hallmarks of the unfalsifiability of theological belief. By this reasoning, literally everything that exists is further evidence of God. Gravity causes the planets to orbit the sun, causing the solar system to function as one self-sustaining system. Isn't this natural? No, the mere fact that it functions proves that God designed it. That geyser functions as a release where there's too much subterranean pressure. Isn't that natural? No, the mere fact that it functions proves God designed it. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. Basically, complexity and functionality are not hallmarks of design. These things happen on their own with no indication of any intelligent involvement. The solar system formed through gravitational influence. Geysers form through pressure punching through the weakest point in the surface. The stars in the sky are there because they're the light of stars millions of light years away that formed in the exact same natural way our own sun did and the fingertips on our hands are the result of evolution by way of natural selection. Once you understand these processes, you understand that they are natural outgrowths of natural occurrences. No design required. Big explosions just simply don't bring about order. They don't cause things that are functional and complex to come into existence. Are you sure about that? A supernova, one of the cosmically largest explosions possible, are so powerful that they induce fusion reactions that result in nucleosynthesis, which is responsible for the creation of most of the elements that are necessary for the formation of new planets and for life itself to exist. We can literally trace most of what makes us up back to interstellar explosions in the universe. Is the periodic table of elements complex? Is the process by which those elements act and interact with each other to create compounds, otherwise known as chemistry, functional? Yes to both. These are the results of explosions. But I'm sure by your logic that this is further proof of God, because if it's complex and it's functional, that means God. Do you see how your position is unfalsifiable? That's a problem, Kyle. That's not good for your side. Proof number three. Life demands a supernatural life giver. You see, in the material world, we have come to understand that there is a law of biology called the law of biogenesis. 
Law of Biogenesis simply says this, that in this material, natural world, life comes from previously existing life of its own kind. Again with the unattributed quotes. And you're actually doing pretty good for a moment. But then you loused it up by shoehorning theistic nonsense into what is an actual scientific principle. All right, to fix it for you, biogenesis, as attributed to Louis Pasteur's work, is stated simply as the belief that complex living things come only from other living things by means of reproduction. It says nothing at all about kinds. That's because kind is a term concocted by creationists as a means to try to argue against evolution. It's a belief that all living things belong to a kind and can never change over time or evolve out of that kind. Do not put that into biogenesis. Biogenesis says nothing at all about kinds. But even as far as biogenesis does seem to support your idea that life has to come from life, that's only if you give the subject a surface level examination. Biogenesis works as an idea about how life spreads and propagates now, on this planet, at present. This planet is so chock full of life that it would be nigh impossible to have utterly lifeless materials on which to experiment to try to produce life from. A single drop of water contains literally millions of viruses, bacteria, and protozoans. And even when you can utterly sterilize materials, no one ever said that getting life from non-living matter was easy, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. While biology does recognize biogenesis, it also recognizes the possibility of abiogenesis, or how non-living chemical reactions can give rise to life under very specific conditions. So just because biogenesis is a thing, doesn't mean abiogenesis isn't. Proof number four, moral law demands a moral law giver. If some things are objectively morally right and other things are objectively morally wrong, then there must be a God. I would agree with that. The problem is that there's no reason to think that anything is objectively morally right or wrong. Morality by its very nature is subjective. Every society in human history has had different cultural conceptions of right and wrong. And more specifically, every person, when you get down to the really specific principles and values that they hold, have different ideas about right and wrong. Kyle, let me put you in a room with a hundred other Christians and you all get really specific about your moral beliefs. I bet you that you'll have some measure of disagreements with every single person in that room about what is right and wrong. Morality is subjective to the individual, to the group, to the culture, and to the society. There's no indication anywhere that there is some overarching objective moral standard. And if there's no objective morality, then there's no moral law giver. Proof number five, free will exists. The atheistic idea that there is no God is founded on the idea of materialism. The idea that this material world is all that there is, all that there was, and all that there ever will be. Because of that, atheism has to suggest that you as a person don't really have free will. I am an atheist, and I believe in free will. I know that there are a lot of atheists who don't believe in free will, but it seems to me to be a disagreement of definition. Those who say there's no free will say that our brains are merely data processing engines that make decisions based on prior experience, biological drive, or instinctive nature to make their decisions and therefore all decisions are deterministic in nature and therefore not truly free will. I look at it in a slightly different way than that. I see free will as being the ability for one to make decisions based on whatever reasoning or criteria they wish, uncoerced from another thinking agent. By that reasoning, yes, my brain is just processing data and making choices based largely on its pre-existing wiring, so to speak. But as long as those choices are not being forced by another thinking being, it's still free will as far as I'm concerned. Now that runs into a real problem where the belief in God comes in, particularly the Christian triomni-god, who's all-knowing, meaning he has perfect knowledge of the future. 
knows every choice you will ever make. Not what choices you might make, but what choices you will make. If that's the case, then our choices are predetermined. And it was God who predetermined them. Because in the Christian belief, he created each and every one of us. And he didn't just create us the way our parents did, just put us together and then let us go to become who and what we would become on our own. But that God created our souls. So our thoughts, our feelings, drives, values, interests, talents, our entire minds are creations of his. So he created us specifically knowing every choice we would make and in effect creating us to make all of those choices. So our choices are completely 100% coerced by the God you believe created us to make them. That eliminates the possibility of free will. If the Christian God exists, we don't have free will as we don't have the ability to make any choices that he is not already predetermined for us. Or he doesn't have perfect knowledge. Or he just doesn't exist at all. And proof number six, human reasoning. You see, we reason on a regular basis. We understand abstract ideas. If we were products of blind, chance, random processes over multiplied millions of years, reasoning and the laws of reasoning simply would have no explanation. Why? Reasoning or the ability to process what is happening around us and explain it is merely an emergent property of the brain. And it's not like it's something unique to humans. Animals process reasons too. It's why if a gunshot comes from their left, a deer will turn and run to the right, because they can reason where the danger is coming from and that they should go in the opposite way. Now, when it comes to things like mathematics or the laws of logic, these may be significantly more complex than the reasoning that the deer was doing, but it's the exact same process. It's our brains processing data in order to explain why things do what they do. From physics to stellar cosmology to algebraic equations, we're not doing anything fundamentally different from a spider determining what that vibration in its web means and acting accordingly. So that's Kyle Butts' six proofs for God dealt with. While there were a couple of semi-decent points that could have been made from them, they were marred by Kyle's incessant desire to shove in theological standards where they don't belong. His misunderstanding of Big Bang cosmology, insisting on the existence of a biological kind, and misquoting scientific principles literally every time he tries to talk about them. These all do a severe disservice to his arguments as a whole. But even if they were properly constructed and quoted, these six arguments still wouldn't hold much water. So thanks for watching, everyone. Don't forget to like this video, comment, and subscribe so you'll always be notified when a new video comes out. Until next time, I'm Professor Plink reminding you to keep striving for greater understanding. It's the best way to get wherever you want to go.